We're very, very fortunate here to have uh, our uh, new colleague, Nancy Stuff, the um, Edward G. Lewis Chair in Law, um, who's also teaching for us. And so, so welcome, Nancy. And Nancy's work, um, Nancy's work spans law and political science, as you can see from the from the title of today's talk. So, um, it's great to have you, and look forward to the presentation. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tony, and I want to thank um, you for coming and for letting me be a part of the SPPD. I'm really excited to start participating in workshops, um, both to receive comments from you guys and um, to give comments um, in future workshops where I'm not presenting. So um, I'm interested in judicial decision making, and I'm particularly interested in um, Judicial, judicial decision making in the context of taxation. So I practiced in the area of tax as a lawyer and then I've studied tax decisions as a scholar and I really just like um, tax in part because a lot of people say they're really hard to figure out these um, judicial decisions in this context. A lot of people are quite critical of how judges decide tax cases. Usually the criticism goes like this. Judges know nothing about taxes. Why are they rendering decisions that govern our lives in this very complex area? And so one of the things I've been trying to do over the course of my career is try to understand what is behind these decisions that get so much criticism from um, both practitioners and from scholars. So I've examined um, what types of arguments are most likely to prevail in court. I've examined um, political preferences and their impact on outcomes and votes. And recently I've been interested in environmental factors. So by that I mean any kind of macro level factor that's not controlled by the judge or the litigator. And I recently finished a big project on war and how war affects decision making in the tax context. And I had a lot of interesting um, insights in doing this project. And, and the outcomes that I found, I thought, um, were, were really fascinating, so I started thinking, hey, I wonder if war has this impact on judicial decision making in the tax context, if other macro level factors do. And so here um, is a paper where I'm trying to figure out, does the economy affect judicial decision making? So um, when I think about the business cycle, what I'm thinking about is the sequence that goes like this. The economy is doing well and it's growing and then it experiences a period of contraction, and then following that, a period of recovery, over and over, over the course of time. And there's a lot of different measures of the state of the economy. Um, a popular one that gets reported in the media is the NBR dating committee, committee um, cycle um, measure. And that's basically just, are we in a period of contraction, or are we in a period of expansion? And so literally all the NBER does is say, we're expanding, 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 oh, we've reached a peak, contracting, 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 we're at a trough. So it's literally an on-off variable. Are we contracting or are we expanding? But there's a lot of other more nuanced variables, such as GDP, that's popular in the media, industrial production and um, output is perceived to be widely responsible to the economy, national income, unemployment. Consumer sentiment is interesting because this is a, um, kind of a feeling variable. How are you feeling about the economy? And the University of Michigan for decades has captured data on how people are feeling about the economy. So not objectively what it is, what do you feel today about the economy? Or what do you feel about the, in this past week? So here is some of the data um, put into a few figures. So here is the NBER and literally um, this is just a scatter plot that I've smoothed over with the lowest curve. And so if the NBER said we were in a period of expansion, I coded this as one, a period of contraction negative one, and so this is um, what the cycle looks like. And here's what I want to point out right from the beginning because it's important for my theory that I'm going to talk about down the road. This um, is obviously the, the depression. And the NBER doesn't say, oh, we're now in a depression. It doesn't say we're in a period of crisis. It doesn't say we're in an extreme situation. It just says we are in a recession, literally. But as the number of recessions keep um, coming over the course of each quarter and each year, they start to pack up. And that's when people say, oh, now we're in a depression. So no one ever says, this is it. It's just that the recession never stops. And so now people claim this is it. So I think of this as um, atypical. 
this period of depression. But mostly, look what we're seeing. It's very typical, these ups and downs. It's not extreme. We haven't um, had anything like what we've had in the 1930s, even today, though this data um, ends in 08, so I'm missing a few years. But still, it wouldn't um, go down this far. I have graphed it. I just don't have it presented here. So this typical versus atypical kind of experience that the nation has is something that I think is interesting and is likely to impact the courts. So before I get to that theory, let me give you a few more pieces of data. The y-axis here is industrial production. The x-axis is just the year. And here I have a, um, I think there must be a pointer. Yeah. Um, here I have zero, a horizontal line. All the dots, regardless of color, basically indicate that industrial production is increasing. Below that line, industrial production is decreasing. The color codes indicate whether the NBER agreed with this other measure. So actually, industrial production is part of the NBER measure itself. But you can see most of the red dots where the NBER says the nation's in a period of contraction, a period of recession, most of those red dots correspond to industrial production that's below the zero line. A few outliers. And most of the blue dots, when the NBER says we're in a period of expansion, that correlates to increases in industrial production. So one of the things about all the measures that I'm interested in is they're not exactly correlated, but they're very correlated. And so that means in my models, I'll examine them separately. But here is just one example of how they're correlated. OK, so one thing that um, I thought about when I started this project, and by the way, the project is very preliminary. I mean, there's a lot of criticisms that you could give, and they would be warranted. So. Um, <laughs> So this, th I consider this extremely preliminary results. And in some way, I'm even hoping to get from you um, thoughts on whether it's a project worth pursuing. So it's a project that ends from my last project. It's actually the last chapter in a book. And so now I'm going to, uh, I have a book contract for this. But I'm not quite sure it merits that. So you, know, you can comment on that. But in my own thinking, I started um, you know, looking at the literature to find out if there's cycling in other contexts. And as it turns out, there must be 200 articles I found with the word cycling in it. Do policymakers cycle? Do employers cycle? Do Social Security recipients act in a cycling way? Um, do voters cycle? In all these contexts, the answer is yes. So we know government actors cycle. So uh, you know, right now, we know that there's um, quite a rush with policymakers trying to figure out how to get this economy to turn around. And even when we don't have an extreme situation like today, though I don't know how extreme it really is, and we know policymakers try to keep the economy um, growing. Market participants, savings rates change, um, employment rates change, employment claims for benefits change. I mean, the list is just on and on. People cycle with the economy, and voters change. And I know there are quite a few people in the room who already are quite um, adept on the voter literature. The things like you know, I was thinking uh, when you originally wrote it, uh, you know, the title, I said, well, why not? You're a tax person, so I understand why you're studying that. But you could be a, an expert on child abuse, right? You could look for similar kinds of cycling and judgment things. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? It does. In fact, um, this project, what I'm showing you today, is actually just a teeny project of how I conceptualize the overall project. So on the last slide, I say, um, what about, I don't have abuse, but I say, what about pandemics, immigration trends, um, it, crime waves? Does the court cycle with these trends as well? And my and bet is it's going to be not, yes. Not so about taxes, but all sorts of decisions. Right. So if I'm going to study the crime waves and their effect on the court, unless I'm going to look at tax crimes, which are few and far between that make it to the court, um, the controversies. I'm going to look at you know, the typical type of crime that involves searches and seizures and blah, blah, blah. So this um, is a focus on I'm going to look at tax cases in the economic context, but you're entirely right. OK, so now I want to focus on voters here. Um, there's quite a bit of literature, starting with Ray Fair in the early 70s. And then, as far as I can see, almost every year since that time, there have been studies showing that voters cycle with the economy. When the economy is doing well, the incumbents are more likely to win. When the economy is doing poorly, incumbents are less likely to win. And there's a debate on why that's the case. But the empirical fact exists. 
voters cycle with the economy. Why that's the case can be debated. That it happens is not debated. And here's a figure um, that I didn't create, Douglas Hibbs created, and it shows <coughs> the incumbent party on the y-axis and then um, real capital income on the x-axis. And you can see, you know, there's quite a close correlation um, between increases in income and the likelihood or the reality of an incumbent um, party member prevailing in an election. The two outliers here are during the war. This is actually something I just spent quite a bit of time thinking about. Um, so I, I let the, the little dots stay there so I could point that out. But in fact, I'm more interested in what happens on average, and that seems to be over and over. Voters are voting um, or assessing the competence of the policymakers by looking at the state of the economy. And they approve when the economy is doing well, and they disapprove and punish when the economy is not doing well. OK, so now my question is the court cycle. A lot of people cycle, policymakers cycle, government actors in general cycle, private individual cycle, voters cycle. Does the court cycle? And the extant literature seems to say no. And the reason I say seems is because no one's actually studied this question. Um, so um, I can't say it actually says no. But when you look at this literature that is investigatory of judicial decision making, it leads to conclusions that suggest the business cycle should not have an effect. So you know, here's an example of some of the factors that play into court's decision making. The legal doctrine, of course, and political and ideological preferences. There's a lot of qualitative literature on how the courts perceive legitimacy and its, important, its importance um, to their jobs. And um, part of what I've done is I've shown in the longer piece that these results suggest the court would not cycle with the economy. So here's what I think. If legal doctrine really is playing the role that so many people argue that it does, which by the way, I don't agree with these results, but um, many, especially lawyers, argue that this is the leading factor, it simply can't be true that the court cycles with the economy if what the court is doing is simply following the extant legal doctrine. And I give examples of this. Um, so <coughs> the literature seems to say the answer to my question is no, I want to empirically test it. So I say judges, uh-huh. Um. You're, you're going to get to this, I'm sure. But right now, I, I'm, I'm not sure what your dependent variable is. So I don't know what it means for the court to cycle, right? So for example, I know what it means for economic voting to happen, right? And I know what it means for the courts to respond to policy preferences, because we might think of a more liberal or more conservative decision. But um, what is the court doing to what, 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 is, what is actually happening? Well, so um, is that a question about my dependent variable? Yeah, I mean, if you tell me your dependent variable, then I'm probably clear. <laughs> OK, so I'll show you how I specify the model. But um, what the answer to that question is, I'm looking at both outcomes and individual votes. Okay. So individual votes, there's about um, 8,000 of them in my data set. And then um, outcomes in cases, there's about 1,000 of them. So the economy goes bad, right? Your claim is that the court would do, would vote how? Ah, that's where I'm going. Right. right, in fact, ta da! Yeah. To answer okay. to Tony, <laughs> thinking about Tony and his very <laughs> important question. So I want to argue judges are like voters in the following way. And my um, kind of theory, such as it is, um, will have empirical implications that I'll spell out in the next slide. So here's kind of the background here. And this looks a lot like the vote in the um, in the political science and the economics literature. So I argue that, or posit, that judges like voters um, care about growth and prosperity. Who doesn't? Who wants um, a contracting economy when they can have an expansionary economy? Um, I think that judges, like most people, um, prefer to have competent policymakers um, in Congress and in the executive branch. And competent policymakers are more likely to achieve growth and prosperity and avoid um, an economy that turns sour on a routine basis. So they want this. Judges like voters want this. How do they get it? Well, in this paper, I say they're going to rely on the actual state of the economy to ass ex um, assess the policymaking competence of um, our financial managers around the nation. So literally, they're going to look to the state of the economy. They're not looking to other types of cues, like verbal cues. The list goes on. And here again, it's slightly different. It's consistent with the political science um, literature, but not all of the political science literature, this particular cue that I'm focusing on. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. To who, what, what the previous slide? Sorry? <coughs> if you could go back to the previous slide. Yeah. <coughs> so, um, who are the nation's financial managers? What, what does that mean? Okay, so what this means um, in my world <coughs> could mean a lot of different things in your world or in the political scientist world. In my world, all I care about are um, litigators in court. So obviously it must be the government, not the taxpayer. So it's the government. Some p in the political science letter, we're just talking about any incumbent. I'm talking about government litigators. So the government is in court. So the reason tax cases are so good to examine is because every single case involves a government, every one. And also, tax cases, actually, uh, tax policy is widely used to turn around the economy. People believe it's important um, to either you know, increase growth or stop a slumping economy. Whether you agree with that is, is not really relevant. It, the fact is, taxes are often talked about like that, so people believe it's relevant or talk as if it's relevant. So these are government actors who show up in court. And the prosecutors are involved witnesses or well, it would be more like this. Um, you didn't pay your taxes last year, did you? <coughs> I am now suing you because I am a government litigator with the Justice Department. And you say, I did pay taxes. I say, well, give me evidence. You don't have any evidence. I go to the district court. I win. I go to the appellate court. I win. And you're still appealing all the way to the Supreme Court. It's me. I'm a Justice Department lawyer um, appointed as part of the executive branch against you, an individual. But you could be a corporation, a partnership, an estate. You could be anything. But I'm always in the picture, the government actor. So the mechanism is that if the economy is good, then the government litigator is, we're, we're going to entrust them with more money. We're going to entrust the government with more money. Yes. Well, that's, that's a very, so let me give this slide, and then I want to talk to that question, because that's a, that's a really good question. So uh, it's easier to answer if I just answer your last question first. So I, I want to say there's kind of a two-pronged approach that the justices have when they're looking at these cases. And in the first context, I say they're going to just look at these typical cycles that occur over and over and over. We've seen them throughout um, history. And they're going to attribute economic downturns to bad policymaking. So when the government shows up in court, they're basically going to say, you and your ilk are responsible for the state of the economy. Um, we don't think you're doing a good job right now. We're going to punish you. But there's a different calculus in the context of an atypical cycle, or so I posit. What I argue here is um, major economic downturns, these deep recessions, we could call them depressions, um, aren't always perceived to be associated with the government's um, decision-making process. Often factors exogenous to the policymakers are believed to play a role, um, foreign policy crises, um, acts of God that cause harvest failures, um, the list goes on. And so here what I say is that the court isn't going to say, you guys are doing a bad job. The court's going to say, this is not a time to punish the government. It's a time maybe to step aside and let the government do what it needs to do, and this will help the economy recover. So obviously, the um, <coughs> court isn't stepping in and saying, hey, let me help make policy in this atypical context. The court is just saying, we're going to stay out of the way, and we're not going to interfere with the decision-making process. So now Tony says, well, what's, what's the mechanism here? Why? So there's a couple. Um, background factors that I think are important to point out in answer to that question. One is that, and it goes to your point, um, and then the second one goes beyond your point. One point is tax cases obviously implicate the budget. And I just spent probably a good year of my life collecting data on how much each of these ca tax cases are worth to the federal budget. And believe it or not, these cases are worth literally, literally billions of dollars. Like there are people who sit around in the CBO calculating the value of these tax cases. So one thing is when you start adopting an anti-government position, you're definitely squeezing the fisc. So less money to spend on these government programs. But it's not only that. Most of the cases that reach the Supreme Court are um, cases that involve um, newer policy choices. And so it's new ideas that are being challenged in court. 
So, you know, the code's been around forever. Um, the, mo the modern iteration of the federal tax code came about in 1913, and a lot of the, um, the issues that were litigated in those early years are just dramatically different from today. So it is literally closing down new possibilities, new <coughs> programs, new tax preferences, closing lo loopholes, and on and on. So it's a two-pronged effect on the government's policy making. Mm -hmm. I know these are both going to be really simple questions, but I have to ask. <coughs> One is, of course, judges last a long time. How do you deal with who appoints them or how they, in some sense, play a role from a, from an ideological perspective and does it matter in your analysis. And then the second one is, at some level, you just suggested that these cases aren't unit, one unit, that there's actually a variety of different ways that the cases could be described. It could be about a new tax code versus an old tax code. It could be about an experimental, if you will, tax, tax code or a special tax code. And, and in some sense, I'm wondering how you're going to handle that as well. So starting with your second question first, which is the harder one. Um, so I, I don't distinguish between the types of challenges that come up, because all of them have fiscal consequences. And so all of them will squeeze the fisc at some, in some way. So one thing about the Supreme Court that's different from appellate courts, which um, you know the Ninth Circuit is where we sit, and it's a collection of cases, but those decisions don't affect the East Coast, so it's uh, the so it's a smaller fiscal effect, and then district courts, that's the trial court, yet even smaller. So the Supreme Court affects the nation wide, and so their their outcomes have a substantial effect on the budget. So in that in that sense, it doesn't matter what type of issue is raised. But just as a fact, um, I think it's important to know from a qualitative perspective that the types of issues that tend to reach the Supreme Court tend to be these newer issues that showed up in recent legislation. So I don't code them as this a new one or an old one because they have the same, they both are important for one prong of the effect, which is. Would it affect, do you think, how they respond? Sometimes because judicial precedent should drive some cases more than other, some decisions more than other, right? Well, if you're a lawyer, you would say absolutely. And on one and I am a lawyer, absolutely. <laughs> but as a public policy analyst, <laughs> um, it's so interesting here. It, well, thank you. <laughs> well. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's a more complicated story. And so I get in fights all the time when I'm on like panels with, with lawyers. So they're like, no, it's how good of a lawyer you are. It's the precedent in the last case. And I say, well, at some point, the data says what it says. And so, but, <laughs> so, um, so, you know, with the Supreme Court, I think what most people would say is because these are issues of what might be called first impression, they haven't been decided by the court before, otherwise the court would not be taking it, there's not a lot of precedent that controls when you get to that level. So, but, you know, that's, yeah, I could, you know, throw a dart in a law school and find someone who would say something slightly different. But in general, the Supreme Court has so much more freedom to, to do what it wants simply because they take so many fewer cases and the precedent has a different sort of effect if it's not directly on point and often there's nothing directly on point. So with regard to your second question, which is um, policy preferences of the judges, I do control for that. I use it as a control. I've been interested in that as, uh, as a unique variable for quite a bit of time. This I just throw it as a control because I've seen it have an effect in some cases but not all. And in this um, paper, I only use the politics of the appointing president. That's a very rough measure of a justice's political preferences. And you know, everybody says, well, hey, Brennan was appointed by a Republican president that then became this amazing Democrat. And so there's a few justices that don't seem to adhere to those preferences of their appointing presidents. But in general, they really do over and over. But there's a reason more um, sophisticated that drives me to use that. And that is, I want to look at judges and justices all the way back to the turn of the century. And the better measures don't go back that far yet. So there's the Martin Quinn measures. There's a lot of measures that the political scientists know about that I just can't use because of my data set is too big for the existing measures. OK, so I have this two-pronged approach. I say typical cycles are going to um, spark punishment 
the government actors, atypical cycles are going to um, have a different empirical implication. And so, um, so I'll show you the results and then I'll use some kind of um, examples of why I think this matters. Um, but as just a footnote before I go on, um, this dichotomy hasn't shown up in a lot of the literature except in some of the formal <coughs> literature in the econ context where um, the typical and atypical cycles are talked about very differently. So it's not my idea to disaggregate, but what I'm doing is trying to draw on these ideas and figure out if there's any empirical implications in the tax context. Okay, so um, you know, I have the sample of cases, taxation controversies, deciding in this, this era. And I already told you why I like taxation controversies for this. I could think of other examples. Um, securities regulation would be another example. Um, employment uh, cases. There just happened to be a lot of taxation cases. I'm like the luckiest person in the world. I picked the most boring area to study, and yet it has a great <laughs> collection of cases. So there's literally over 1,000 cases in my time period. Um, and so you know, then I'm going to look at these environmental factors and just show you some preliminary um, results. So here are the models. This goes to Tony's question. Um, my dependent variables are just literally the votes and the outcomes. I care a lot about outcomes because after all, did the government win or lose? Was the government closed down in this new policy proposal or was it allowed to continue on? On the other hand, judicial votes are interesting because it gets to the individual level behavior. And so outcomes are really interesting for lawyers, but votes are interesting to understand judicial behavior. Um, so that's why I use both of them. Here are my list of variables, and I, I look at these variables all independently. So I'm literally going to have six models. Um, there's the NPER cycle and these other variables that I showed you in the first slide. And then here, here are my controls. Um, you know, these are variables that I or others have found to affect um, judicial decision making. I'm not going to show you the results with those variables because all I really care about are these variables. So, okay. Are all the controls significant? Because if um, you had misspecified the model, then it wouldn't be, right? So are all those significant? Are they just individually measured like that? I mean, are these like dichotomies, or what are those control variables? So this is um, what is shown over and over with regard to my first control, is whoever is the petitioner is much more likely to win. So basically what that means is if I lost below, I petition for a rehearing in the Supreme Court. And because the court much more often reverses than affirms, the petitioner generally wins. And there's a big literature on why that's the case. So this is um, a binary variable. Um, judicial politics is also a binary variable coded as I just articulated. Um, whether the taxpayer was a corporation is um, also binary. And this is whether there was a wartime law at issue. And this captures a component of this book project I just finished, which says war has a huge impact on how these cases come out. Basically, if it's a war law, the court always gives its stamp of approval. It just says, yeah, go ahead, if we're in a period of crisis. Now, what is a war was a big question for that project. But here, I'm just using it as a control. And so were they statistically significant? Um, whoops. Actually, I probably should have um, noted a few more things. But these, if they're not statistically cons uh, significant, I'm always a little surprised. And they all are. Although this, I can't promise you that it was, because often judicial politics don't show up in tax cases unless it's a corporate um, taxpayer. So individual level, a state level, uh, politics seems to play less of a role. But I also have fixed effects for um, individual judging. Um, I have a couple other controls that are just aren't interesting, like the year, le the year, a year control, time trend, stuff like that. OK, so um, here I want to just now show you what I'm expecting. These are my six models, all done separately, all um, fit separately. And for the pre-1930 era, this is what I think of as a typical cycle. And I'm expecting when the economy is doing well, so will the government in court. When the economy is doing poorly, so will the government in court. During the Depression, an atypical cycle, I expect actually the opposite. When the economy is doing poorly, the government starts to do well. So this is a way of the court getting out of the way of um, the government when they're trying to repair the economy. And here, um, the post-World War II, or the post-1940s, I should say the post-Depressionary era, 
Um, I expect positive coefficients, except, of course, unemployment. That's a countercyclical variable. So as unemployment goes up, that means, obviously, the economy is doing badly. So I expect a negative coefficient. And I excluded World War II when I fit the models, just to see if there was some confounding factor with all those cases that showed up in World War II. There are a lot of cases that showed up on the docket during World War II. And, um, and I think they have a confounding effect, so I ran this twice, um, once with, once without the, um, the, war, the war cases. OK, so now here are my results. I'm looking at judicial votes. Six separate models, and this is a D probit, so you can interpret the coefficients like you would in a linear regression model. And um, I, I don't know what's going to go on in the pooled cases. I don't have any forecasts there. But here are my 1930s variables. And I can only run up to 1940 models with these two business facts. And the reason for that is all of these other factors um, were not collected and put into public databases prior to 1940. So this is why I only have two business facts for the pre-1940s era. And in pre-1930, the typical period, I expected to see positive coefficients, and I am seeing positive coefficients. When the economy is doing better, so is the government in court. Um, when I get to the atypical era, I expect the opposite. And again, I'm actually seeing consistent with my um, prediction that as the economy starts doing poorly, the government starts to do better, though industrial production is not statistically significant. Here's the post-1940 era. Again, we're back into the typical cycle. And the coefficients are largely going in the direction I expected. Only two are statistically significant. But you know, some support for my theory. And then when I throw out World War II, quite a bit of support for my theory. So you know, here I'm thinking in this very preliminary study, um, there's uh, so much more to do with regard to the analysis of these cases, obviously. But for a preliminary study, I say, hmm, it's, you know, it's pretty good, suggesting some support. And now um, kind of the political scientist in me wanted to look to see what would happen if we disaggregated by political preferences. Because there's a lot of literature. Historians have really studied the court, especially during um, the Depressionary era to see how the justices were responding to Roosevelt when he was trying to institute a lot of plans. And I think of this study as a particularly hard result to find. And the reason for that is the literature is uniform. The literature says that the court punished Roosevelt over and over and over until about 37, and then suddenly went his way. I say I don't believe it. I say that when, the, when the, the nation is doing so poorly, we know there are some popular, well-known cases, but not consistently. I don't believe that consistently that's what the court is going to do. And so um, here is an attempt I've already shown in the aggregate that wasn't the case. Now let's look at, um, at this, and we can get some more nuances. So pre-1930s, the Democrats are doing what I expected, and so are the Republicans, both at statistically significant levels. So they're, they're basically joined together doing what I showed in the aggregate context. Now I'm going to look at the Depression. And here, the Democrats are doing what I expected. But notice the Republicans are not. So I'm going to, I'm going to skip by that and, and come back. And I'm going to point out now we're back in the typical era. Democrats are you know, kind of doing what I suggested, but not very strongly. Republicans are really doing what my model predicts. And if I throw out World War II, we see a stronger effect for the Democrats and the Republicans are acting exactly how I expected in the post-1950 era. So you know, here, a lot of people talk about, oh, the court is so divided by politics. And I say they become united more than expected, at least on the margin, when um, the economy is involved in these cases that involve economic issues. So here's the outlier. The Republicans don't do what I expected. I thought they would act like I saw the Democrats act and in the aggregate. But when I disaggregate, they're doing something differently. And you know, I really pondered that. And so um, you know, if you look at it, they're, they're in fact acting like the economy is a, in a typical downward um, situation. It's certainly contracting, but um, maybe not in an extreme sense. And so in this case, the Republicans are acting like it's a typical 
downward trend, not an extreme trend. So I looked at the cases. I started looking at the cases. I read a lot of cases to understand how judges talk about this. And this is a famous case called Blaisdell. The top quote is from the um, majority opinion, which had um, both Democrats and Republicans, but mostly Democrats. The bottom opinion is written by what lawyers love to call the four horsemen, um, four Republicans who basically hated um, Roosevelt. And look at how they talk. The top uh, um, opinion says, you know, this is, we're in a financial crisis. It's as if some um, freak of nature has happened. We must act in a way that helps the government improve the economy. But look how the Republicans are talking. Ah, it's nothing new. Seen, you know, years of a plenty alternated with years of failure in the past. And so th this is exactly what I would expect would happen in a, the language I would expect in a typical situation, the typical downturn and typical upturn, and that's how the Republicans are acting. So the reason I think this is really neat is it's not inconsistent with the theory, but what it does is it suggests how you're looking at the economy matters. And here's what I think is really interesting for today. We're about to see the Supreme Court decide the health care law. This is an example of exactly what I'm talking about, these new cases with first, um, that raise issues of first impression. Everybody's wondering, how is the um, court going to decide it? And of course, the Obama administration asked for review. So are the uh, justices going to act like we're actually in a serious recession, maybe even a depression, or is it just a typical scenario? If it's typical, I think the government's in trouble. If it's a typical um, uh, situation in the business cycle, I say the government's in trouble, and my prediction is they're going to lose. And we're going to see language that will suggest one thing or another. If it's atypical, if Roberts, which has suggested we're in an atypical situation, and a few others, Kennedy, who's considered to be the median justice, think of it as atypical, then um, Obama's much more likely to prevail. So, you know, that's something interesting that we can learn about um, the cases going forward. Uh huh. Have you tried to look at this by sections? Because, of course, the court, like the rest of America, looked at not just the whole 30s, but really the 30s as three periods, the, the early part, the middle part, and the, the end. And it'd be intriguing to see if that differed across the, the, the three big historical moments um, and changed. Yeah, so one thing that I, there's not enough cases to divide the decade into three periods, but what I could do is throw out the, the post-37 era. And the reason that's important is because historians say the only time we should see this is post-37, only. No other time period. And I say I don't agree with that. And in fact, when I throw out the 30s, the post-37, my results don't change at all. So, you know, there's a lot of ways that, and I can talk to you about why I think um, both the um, historical work on this era and this work could both be right. But one thing we know, I think, is that it has to be more nuanced than the story is told now. But I can't divide it into three eras. So you're entirely right. We start seeing an uptick for not even a whole year. It's actually more like nine months. And then it goes back to a serious decline. I think that's a very good point. That, um, these perceptions of what the situation is is not a bunch of economists looking at numbers, but amateurs reading the newspaper. Um, as far as I can tell. And so they have an impression. And that's what you were getting in the quotes, right? You know, they, you know, what might have happened differently is if they were a bunch of economists, they might have you know, said things are bad or good because they agree on the numbers. Um, but the other question in my mind is, is there a literature that does this a lot for lots of uh, Supreme Court decision making? where you have some sort of external variables which you're trying to predict what people will do? Yes. So um, I'd probably say I was one of maybe one of one who studies tax. <laughs> maybe, maybe some people might say um, they dabble in it. And, yes. All right. Take, but, yeah. but in the criminal, in the, um, criminal context, in the constitutional context, there's a giant political science literature. I mean, just vast. And so what's interesting to me is the, the contrast between the doctrine-based, doctrine, doctrine based, argument-based stuff that the law school professors typically do. Except for not at USC. Huh? USC is very social science. Yeah, I know, I know. I, I go to their seminars. I just want to make sure. Some of my best friends are in the law school. So How about that one, time. right? <laughs> Which is true, by the way. But anyway, um, uh, yeah. but, you know, what, what they are said to, you know, that they teach their students. How about that? <laughs> All right? And the, 
And what's interesting to me is that it would be nice to have an understanding of how these macros, these um, growth results, play out intimately. In other words, you could say, well, it's a statistical phenomenon. You know, no particular thing. But I assume that, in fact, these kinds of observations then might be seen in the individual doctrinal discussions. Am I making sense? Yes. And um, one thing that I have done and that responds to what you're thinking about is um, I read basically um, every case that raised an economic issue between about 1900 and 1930 just to see if there was even discussion of economic issues. Because now the story is economics are just completely irrelevant to the, to the justices' behavior. And what I found is that, like just literally consistently, there is a discussion in all the different contexts that raise an economic issue about the economy. Is this a good policy? Is this a bad policy? We think it's gone too far, not far enough, blah, blah, blah. And I haven't read the crime um, cases, but my bet is there's discussion too. You know, we need to make sure, you know, the terrible wave of crimes means there's some anecdotal evidence about that, but I just don't know consistently how often that shows up. It certainly shows up here. So there's definitely kind of um, a micro level um, effect here where the economy comes in with the judicial opinion. The historical uh, colleagues in the law school would find this, you know, someone like uh, Ariella or uh, what's her name, um, who wrote, just wrote this book on war. Uh, oh, not Dan Thurman. Who? Oh, not Dan Thurman. No, no, a Mary woman, Desi. Mary, oh, Mary Desi, yeah, 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 would find this sympathy, would do the same thing. They would find in the individual judgments reflections of these global issues yes. all the time. Yeah. That's what they do find from what I've heard the seminars. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a very interesting thing because you teach law students something about, you know, legal argument and so forth. And then we ignore it in our work. Huh? And then we ignore it in our work. And but you, but the historians and the social science the convention of social scientists have something else going on. Yeah. Right. Um, I'm interested in the nature of tax uh, litigation as opposed to you know like the healthcare law. Uh, you know, studies of congressional decision making really vary by the nature of the policy issue that's being considered. So. If you're dealing with social welfare versus sewers and roads, uh, you get a different kind of congressional decision making. You're going to get, in the latter case, a lot more pork barrel allocation, not that much uh, ideological dispute. But if you're dealing with social welfare, it's going to be heavily influenced by ideology. Uh, and I suspect that tax policy is not all that ideological. So. Um, the influence of ideology on how people think about this maybe is not as much as it might be in the, you know, in the healthcare reform law. Uh, I mean, you're getting that a little bit during the recession, I, I mean the depression, right, where the, almost anything was politicized with the court, because, partly because of Roosevelt. Right. Uh, so I, I was, a, I'm a little concerned that you just quickly go to well, we're going to see how this plays out in health reform law, because I, I really see that as a very different thing. I mean, the health reform law is like a political flashpoint between Republicans and Democrats. It's one of the key things Republicans hate about Obama. It's one of the key things that you know the Democrats came in trying to do. It's one of the major issues that divides the party. That's not like these individual tax litigation issues. It's, it's really quite different. And I'm, I'm wondering to what extent it, the fact that you've picked something that at least seems like you even used the word boring, right? I mean, it seems boring. Well, it seems boring because it's not political right. as much, right? But you've picked something like that, that that limits the generalizability of these findings, or at least the, 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 in, importance of this kind of factor. It, it may be more important in these kind of situations than maybe right. other kinds of issues that are more political just in there. Right, where we might see more of a role for politics. As I'm seeing uh, political parties joining up except for in one small era and not really even a lot of data given I only have two measures. You might find that what you see there in the 1930s actually much more common in other even areas. in the normal eras. 
So I have a couple comments to that, and I really love that question because it's a question that I need to specifically answer in this project. On the one hand, I completely agree with you that tax doesn't seem to be as political as other contexts um, in Congress and elsewhere. And there's been a lot of studies that show, you know, pretty much the Democrats want to give money to their constituents back home, and so do Republicans, and the tax code's a great way to do it. So I vote for you, you vote for me, and we're all happy. That's why I'm thinking it's more like pork barrel allocation yeah. decision making than it is like decision making Political. on social right. welfare or right. issues that are ideological flashpoints. Right. So um, in some ways, then, we might say, hey, you know, we might actually see a role for the economy in these less politicized areas like securities regulation and tax. And um, so, so that I agree with all that, and I need to think about that. But here's the thing. If you look at these cases, um, the, the rhetoric is almost outrageous. Like, the government cannot steal money from, from these corporations any longer. And the, literally, language will show up like this. And the language is often kind of tied. Or judicial doctrine. I wouldn't call it doctrine. I would just call it rhetoric. And here's the thing why I think you're really going to be surprised about why I don't agree with your comment. Most people view the health care law as a tax controversy, because it is the tax that's being imposed on people when they fail to get health care. So people call it a tax, and in fact, most people say that it'll probably be decided as a tax issue. When it gets, so it's been litigated as a tax issue in most of the courts, most recently, I guess, in the Third Circuit, and it's definitely I, being. Uh, I, I think the key issue is not the tax. I think the key issue is the mandate, and the mandate is an issue of individual freedom. It's it's posed, it's posed as a as a you know constitutional freedom issue. Does the government? have the right to require me yeah. to purchase a private good. But you know, a lot of people said the same thing about all the Social Security cases, and those are tax cases in the data set. I mean... But this is more than a, a typical tax case, I mean, at least in my mind. Well, you know, maybe one thing I could do to get after this um, is there's a lot of cases that just simply are, they, they seem so much more about the money involved. Like, even if you look at the way they're briefed by the government, the, the government literally offers figures on the losses to the budget. Here, that's not what's being litigated. It's litigated in a certain, in a different way. So maybe a way to capture your concern, which is now my concern, is to kind of add that as a controlling variable and see, or literally even um, disaggregate the cases and look at kind of the more finance-oriented ones versus the public policy worries about the substance. So that's, that's really helpful. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, Christian, and just go around the table. OK. Would well, I, one, I, had one a couple, I had a couple ideas. Um, so I would be interested. The co-fishers were mentioned in the latter period, at least for the Republicans. And my hunch, I don't know if this works, said more people have retirement account stock holdings in the latter part of this period, hardly anyone's investing in the stock market earlier. It actually personally affects them, potentially, depending on how close they are to retirement. Maybe that's something to think about. Um, but then the other thing was, it seems you, you framed it as them punishing government uh, or rewarding the government, but could it be, do you want to separate out, not just have the dummy variable for corporations, but separate out corporate tax cases from individual tax cases, because you might be willing to let individuals during a depression go but you might want to really set up the corporations, some interaction with corporation, and or maybe you've already done that, and the economic variables, or even ideology, economic variables, and corporation. Yeah, so I mean, by disaggregating this, I'm clearly, uh, you know, it's the same as an interaction term between politics and the economic variable. But um, what I have- But you don't have, you, you just have a dummy variable for corporation or not, right? So with regard- I'm thinking to difference between corporate mm -hmm. cases and Yes. Well, um, what I have found is that corporations seem to um, raise the political hackles of the justices more readily, and, and I observe that empirically. The individual cases sometimes involve poor people, sometimes involve vast, vastly rich people that are arguing about estate planning. So um, definitely it's, it's harder to capture what's going on in the individual level because it's such a, a diverse collection of cases. So, um, so I have run the model just with corporate cases, and the same thing shows up. And then 
Um, I don't know if I've ever ran it with individual level cases because they're just such a disaggregated collection. But I could and start seeing just what's going on. Could I wasn't thinking about the results would differ necessarily. The corporation results should be the same, but the, yeah. the logic is that they're punishing corporations during a depression instead of helping the government during a depression. Yeah. And, uh, um, it's just a different theory. It's a different way to say it, but then it gives you pause. Yeah. But then with individual, well, but then I don't know what to expect with individual mm -hmm. tax cases. Yeah. It's way out of my realm. Of, uh, what is the breakdown between the corporation and individual cases? Are the predominantly corporation, corporate, uh, no, um, it's about a third individual, a third corporate, and then a third other. And the other could be a partnership, mm -hmm. and that's um, something called an S-corp. There's a whole estate, there's a lot of different types of entities that are neither a corporation nor an individual. And so people never know which category to put them in. I never actually know either, but the one thing I know is that they're definitely not a corporation. And so that's why that's a particularly good subset to look at. But like what Christian's saying, I mean, you're right. I could maybe try to figure out, is there something with another clear-cut group, um, like individuals, not these weird middle-of-the-road entities? Yeah, that's a good idea. Okay. Nancy, I want to follow up on Jack's question, but in a slightly different way. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm just also, just, just to be picky, what is going on with 40 to 2008, that first coefficient? And the business cycle for Republicans can't be significant if that's the standard error in parentheses there. That's got to be an error. So these but, are do you probe it? Oh, probe it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So in any case, let me just ask you about, I mean, it's a follow-up to Jack's question, though, with respect to the magnitude. I think it's fascinating that you find these, and it's cool that you find them. The issue is the magnitude of those effects. In other words, if you've got a whole bunch of stuff going into decision-making, at, at the individual level, which is what these data are, right? So individual person is rendering a decision here. Yep. What, you don't, what I don't see here are, I see the magnitudes of these effects to be relatively small compared to the others. This is a, this is a dummy variable on the business cycle, right? Right. The negative one or, or one or one or zero or something like that. So if you go back to the couple slides earlier where you showed what the specification of the model is and you had four other the main ones that lawyers would say are important, the politics stuff, the whatever, the, the four variables. What is the size of those coefficients compared to these? I think it's cool that you find them to be significant, but look at the size of those effects. They're very small, which is not to say that it isn't important to demonstrate them. But when you're interpreting results, what I'm asking you to do is tell us what the magnitude of those effects are with respect to the other variables in the model. So if the overall argument you're trying to make is that in tax cases, you find that the business cycle influences outcomes. That's a great finding, but by how much? Yeah, right? so I think I have a, oh, I guess I don't. Um, now I've lost everything. So I have actually a graph that shows you, and, um, and actually some of these variables are remarkable in their effect. It's almost as if the government is virtually guaranteed to win in certain contexts when unemployment gets super high. So on the is way to getting is there a threshold then? That I don't. That I, I could easily know, but that I just haven't run um, the data to create a picture, and I don't even have the picture I wanted to show you, which is, which is disappointing. But, um, but so the magnitude is pretty notable. I mean, pr even shocking at some points. But I think that you're right. It'd be kind of neat to say at what point do we see a big jump. So I could literally put in lots of different measures of unemployment at X, Y, and Z and see at what point I see the big jump. Well, and also, I mean, as a methods point then, so if you're telling, I, I, I believe you, even though I don't see the data, but I believe you that those effects are big. Well, so these, even what I have up here, they're like 12, 13 percent increase in the likelihood of a government prevailing. I mean, this is a giant. Remember, you move the, well, you move the, the, the decimal point over two points. So the business cycle. They're, they're all in single digits, as far as I remember on that last one, right? They were yeah. like one and five. Should be able to just hit that five and it'll come oh. back. To the but I mean, the, aside from that, the, if, if you're, if you're going to suggest some kind of a threshold effect and that it, it sort of grows over time, you may want to consider a, an estimation method that uses some kind of moving average of that um, as opposed to just pure old, you know, what you're doing is you're sort of trying to do that by separating them into cohorts or into stages, but you may be better off using some other kind of econometric technique where you can do something over time to demonstrate whether there's, you know, the, the growth of that effect. So that when it's bad, 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 it should accelerate. You might be seeing that in the threshold. So I, I might recommend that. 
The other one is, is a follow-on to both of these, and that is the question of the dependent variable. So you're telling us that we just heard now the dependent variable has got three elements, corporate, individual, and some other stuff, no, right? just vote. No, I, I know, but, but um, that is to say the type, the type of case that it is. Your dependent variable is what if we ran a, a frequency on it and you had a variable that said what type of the case is it? You yes. tell us it was those three. Yes. And that, um, and you're also telling us that there's no variation in the model when you look at them separately, right? So if you could look at them separately, you wouldn't see any differences? Well, I've only looked at the corporate separately. Um, I ha the others, I haven't, I'm not that interested in seeing if those others are having a unique, because I don't have a theory. If you want to generalize them. beyond it, you have to know what that is, right? So that's, yeah. that's your point, that you have more heavily politicized cases, you want to see that. So you can't make a generalization. I would be uncomfortable making a generalization to other types of cases outside of tax. In first, if you don't know what the difference, if the model doesn't behave the same way for all three types. But furthermore, if in a more highly politicized situation, all tax is not created equally, right? So all those cases should not necessarily be the same. And the question of whether or not they're you know, individual or corporate is the, is the proper distinction between them, or the relevant one between them remains up for grabs. So maybe you could look at your all those cases, you know, all of the dependent variables together and, you know, see what, what sort of pops out if you do a factor analysis or something like that, if they hang together in a different way. Or alternatively, to look at a different set of dependent variables. So in other words, that you would gather, you have a single case study, and so you have less leverage to then go from generalizing from that case study. I mean, what if you used cases on, I'm thinking about now this most recent case in Alabama. It's a federal district court case uh, that basically allowed most of that immigration law to go forward mm -hmm. in Arizona, or uh, not Arizona, oops, Alabama. So the question being, you may, what if you tried federalism cases or unfunded mandate cases, something like that? I don't think you, you're not going to get enough leverage by just talking about tax. So if you're thinking, looking for suggestions for other things that you want to pick another comparative case study of mm -hmm. policy areas that could get you to a point where you could still, can, and if you could demonstrate that, that would be really great. Yeah, so um, those are great points. Um, some of the stuff I can do and some of the stuff I can't do. So like um, what I have done is to do like um, a count model where I try to figure out if the number of times NBER says we're in a recession, if at some point it flips to a punishing model versus a supportive model. And it's just not enough, not enough cases for me to do that over the course of years. But your um, other ideas for trying to kind of disaggregate some of these results are really great. Now. Um, I have to say, if I can add any nuance to tax decision making, I'm going to be really happy because people say you cannot explain it. And so even if this whole project boils down to a, something else that helps to explain tax, I'm happy. But if I go on with the book project, the book will have different chapters. And one idea is immigration. Um, another idea is crime. Um, health, there's a lot of different. So I definitely want to go beyond this to kind of check out what's going on and if these um, these macro level factors are having an effect. If I want to only think about the business cycle, then I have to kind of contain my cases to the collection of businessy type cases like SEC reg or securities regulation. But one of the things I'm really liking about this colloquy, I've never heard anybody but a tax audience get a little obsessed about corporate versus individual cases. <laughs> that is such a fine nuance that, in fact, I don't even know if I hear anybody but tax people kind of pick on this. So I love that policy. Um, making wonks <laughs> or, or policy wonks are worried about this because I think it is a good thing to worry about and I'll definitely try to disaggregate some of these ideas that both of you guys have. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. This is very interesting and just from my, I used to be a criminal defense lawyer and now I'm just doing it here, um, but wanting to make tax a little bit more interesting because we've never really looked at it, maybe to offer some context for the creation of the individual tax code. Uh, looking at the compromise that was created between the southern states and the northern states um, in order to actually institute an individual tax. Um, that might, just for people who aren't indoctrinated, give a sense of why it's very political and why, why it is a valid lens to begin looking at this uh, kind of data. Uh, because the very birth of tax code is through politics and economy and, and debates about whether property should be taxed at a national level versus individual revenue. So I mean that, even just as a preface to your book, might might give some context so that people could say, wait a minute, this is a sexy lens. You know, this this is this is a way of looking at judicial decision making outside of 
precedent, which if you're working it maybe in a misdemeanor trial court, you might see a data set, like judges making decisions about whether to allow pre-trial um, diversion programs, right? That might not be based on precedent. That uh, one of my uh, student, one of the students in one of my classes brought that up in his trial courts. That's the experience. So I'm very excited about it. I think that there are um, applications of your investigation that could translate into other areas. But yeah, well, um, certainly, I mean, 1913, which is why I start the investigation here, is the time when the um, 16th Amendment of the Constitution emerged after a whole series of cases where the Supreme Court said it's just unconstitutional to impose this type of tax, this income tax. And so you're entirely right. There were a lot of political squirmishes. But remember, my study isn't so much about politics. My study is, I don't care what your politics are. Do you care about the economy, Mr. and Ms. Justice? So I'm not really sure I want to say this is all about politics. Instead, I more want to say, irrespective of politics, will you do as I posit, Mr. and Ms. Justice? But you're entirely right. I mean, if you look back prior to 1913, people say some of the most politicized, I mean, Pollock v. Farmers insurance is, is a great case, in part because it was litigated over and over in the Supreme Court. And every single time, the Supreme Court says, this is socialism in action. No, supreme, no um, income tax is constitutional. And so then you know, we went around and um, changed the Constitution. So you're entirely right. Prior to that time, there was a lot of that type of debate and controversy. But I'm trying to get away from that. What I'm trying to actually say is politics are interesting, but I want to see if there are other factors that help us explain what's going on here. And I guess I'm just suggesting if you, if you frame it and say, this is the history that we're dealing with, and this is exactly what you just articulated right now, um, this, this is the nuance that I'm trying to isolate so that we can bring the discussion to a deeper level. Yes. It might be valuable for those who are not um, in the data the way that you are. Thank you. Yeah. Tony? Yeah. Um, so there are, there are a few points. One is boring and kind of a point, which I, we can talk about at uh, uh, coffee afterwards. But the big thing that that still troubles me is I don't know what your theory is. I still don't, yeah. right? So you're predicting <laughs> a vote, know. right? You're predicting a vote. The marginal benefit of agreeing with the government has to be greater than the marginal of benefit of not agreeing with the government. And you're predicting two types of behavior and two different types of regimes. If this were a simple spatial vote, you would get, you would expect um, your preferences to go in favor of the party in power, say, in the government, right? So you might say, Democrats will vote with a Democratic um, government, and uh, Republicans will vote with a, with a Republican administration when they, when they put the cases up. But I'm not sure what this splits, right? And so I'm not, I'm not sure what, so if there are two dimensions here, say, right, to this policy area, I'm not sure what the trade-off really is. Now, Leslie's point is not entirely historical. There may be a reason underlying these cases where you might say that you know, a Republican is just going to vote for the government in a dramatic downturn like this. Now, I don't know what that is, right? Because ideologically, we might think we want to have hands off, inject more money to businesses. We might vote against the government, right? But it's, the, it's sorting out that trade-off that I'm not entirely sure about. But once you do that, and if the results sort of hold up, I think that's, I think you have something really interesting there. But, but that, that's, that's one point. The second point, which I think is worth stating here, is you've got all these different variables measuring the economic conditions. I think, you know, Jane, Jane su suggested it in a, in a slightly different way, but I think, you know, why not just try to measure that? Because you've got, you know, you have all these different things. You have the one measure that goes across time, which would be nice for your nice, you know, integrated model, right? But for the other ones, why not, why not just try to measure it by, uh, you know, some sort of factor model and then, and then working on it that way? So it's, it, it's at least a thought because the clear, um, the clear implication would be you see these economic conditions changing, and you see the probability of the vote changing, right? And that's your that's your that's the story you want to tell. And that's and, and if you can justify the measure, 
then that's a really that's a really clear story. But on the theoretical um, point, I, I wonder what you think. Well, um, so I so both you and Jane now have pointed out that, and I think this is capturing what you guys one point of Jane's. There was a number there, but I think both of you guys are saying, how do you know when something is in fact a deep recession or a depression? Not even that. I mean. Because that's a big one. That yeah. definitely comes out of Jane's comment. So this is where right. I thought you were going. I don't even know why we would want to create these ethics yet. Because I don't know if, if, if I'm trying to think, I'm asking you kind of a Harris School question. Who's maximizing what? The yeah. judge is the only actor. That's your probate. Who, who, what maximization problem is leading to that, that outcome that you're seeing? And that's the theoretical, um, that's the theoretical leap that I that I see here, right? Because when you say there's different behavior in one era than in another, I wonder what the systematic story is. And it can't be policy preferences, which to me actually is the most interesting thing. Because right. now it's not judicial politics. All of a sudden the attitudinal model not explaining something um, very interesting, right? But but what the alternative story is is what I'm is what I'm missing. So you don't buy this is like literally just I read the mm. political science literature and put it right here in my paper. Yeah. So you don't buy the idea that sh that voters uh, maximize utility when they vote incompetence out of office. Sure, I do. But you you're telling me that a judge does that differently in two different eras. You're 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 telling a conditional version of the economic. Yeah. Voting story. You're telling us. You're telling economic voting in what you called uh, typical times, yeah. and then you're telling a different story in atypical times. And yes. it's, it's the it's the systematizing of that story that I don't believe. Well, here's the thing. I don't think I'm inconsistent with political science because no political scientist has ever tried to go back and look at um, what goes on in atypical times. Most again. of this is like a post 1950s literature. So I don't know what they would say, frankly. I mean, I've read every single thing out there, and I, I have no idea. So they might agree with this. There's some language that would suggest yes, or some language that would suggest no. But um, so you buy the post 1950s story. Yep. You buy that. Okay. I buy that there's a theory. Post okay. Okay. Yeah. And I would say that's where my dad is the strongest, mm -hmm. because I have lots of different variables. There's a lot of different mechanisms I could get at that. I have yeah. a lot of votes. I have a lot of cases, so I can do that. So, um, and it's kind of, you know, to just to stress the point, it's kind of interesting to say, you know, a justice of the Supreme Court is not any different when thinking about economic conditions as the average voter. Okay. That's a shocking <laughs> theory. Uh, I don't yeah. think it is necessarily the same because judges, I mean, these guys don't have to worry about losing their job when the economy is down the way a voter does. So it's not necessarily fair mm -hmm. well. Like, voters care about it because of their own personal. What about a sociotropic argument, though? Well, I mean, I just find that I don't yeah. buy that as much. So you buy a pocketbook version. But their portfolios are but they don't crapping have a, out. But that, that's why, oh, that's but why I'm not going to lose my job. I yeah. lost my entire estate. But I still have that $100,000. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. But I, think that I actually think the confidence is different between a, a regular voter and a judge, where the judges are more insulated than the voters. You want to think about the difference. Like, they care about the stock market. Yeah. Like, they don't care about all the other stuff that a regular voter does. Yeah. yeah, so that's one thing. Well, so let me stay here for a minute. You can actually still make the argument that judges are so Yeah. That's right. my theory. Right. Yeah. And so I could. Then, then I would still see the argument, but you can't make the same argument in the 1930s. Right. So I agree that this is at the heart. This is a very hard part of my paper. Um, I think I'm on much safer ground post 1950s. It seems other people think that you think that, and then I want to go back and say something a little weird. And I mean, part of where this comes from, this idea, is really from some of the formal economics literature. And it's trying to understand why policymaking in Congress looks a little different in periods of crisis, or should we ex or we should expect it? And they have all these kind of like, well, people's political preferences seem to abate a bit in a crisis, or it's quick acting, and so people are more. There's all sorts of explanations, but what the literature says is we seem to observe it, and, and we probably should expect it. Um, so you know, I can see you know why. There are some people who go down this road, 
And it goes back to the Roosevelt era. Like people were saying, we have this extreme crisis and we're undermining these plans to put the country back, you know, into action. So I think intuitively it makes sense. Um, some of the formal literature says it, it does make sense from that perspective, so I put it in here. But um, it's only one error I have, right? Yeah. That's, a, that's a big problem. So I agree with that. It'd be nice if um, like this recession continued on. <laughs> so we had a second deep that's depression. <laughs> so that's good. Very well. Very well. So good thing to say in a policy. <laughs> so I agree, like, um, it's kind of on weaker ground, you're not really buying it, I'm trying to say it's not even my idea, I'm drawing on other literatures, like I personally think it intuitively makes sense, I'm seeing some support for it, but it is, it's an N of one, because I have like about so 10. N of one, it's an N of about 22,000 according to your sample size. Well, what I mean is, I see ups and there's about 10 cycles in the typical period, 10 peaks or five peaks, five troughs. There's just like in this extreme case, I really only have one period where I can examine this. So, you know, maybe I should make this paper less about the pre 1950s era. Well, I mean, you, that's clearly a paper that you could write, right? But there's there's something there's something that you said regarding the. And I, I don't know how to I don't know how to put this theoretically, but when you brought up the war cases, right? I'm thinking about things like administrative law. So during the during the war, the government gets to do all kinds of things. I'm sure it's true in tax. I'm sure it's true in other kinds of things, right? You you mentioned this yourself. You have a book on it, right? What <coughs> what mechanism does that in wartime? What about the crisis actually? lifts something. So it lifts doctrine at some point, right? You know, well, you know, we've got all these kind of civil rights protections, but you know, we're, we've got to think, this, this is just crisis decision making right now, right? So doctrine comes up, but is there something where you can say that the judge, when looking at this, um, when looking at this situation, there's something in what the, in the judge's utility function like, safety and security and who knows what, right? <clears throat> but is there something that Protection they're trading off? Is there something that they're trading off in that period that just switches the switches the results? Then at least you'd be theoretically consistent and you could tell the the entire story. I don't know what that is, but the war analog is probably the closest thing that you have in the story that you've told to it. Right. Yeah, so I mean there's so many graphs that I wish I had in this um, presentation, but in the war story basically I say that judges are going to trade off their desire for security and safety against these all these other types of factors such as their political preferences, their desire to follow doctrine, and there's a list of them, statutory interpretation preferences, and I say when they start getting cues that we're in a foreign policy crisis, they're going to start picking more pro-government positions and trade off these other preferences that we would expect to arise and be more important in times when there isn't a foreign policy crisis. So maybe that happens in economics as well. Right. And so, right. And, you know, I have a graph where I have, like, this utility curve and, you know, these two types of preferences. And I wish I had had this because it would have made a perfect answer to your question instead of a verbal answer. But one of my findings um, in the war context is... If there are really, there are certain kinds of wars that spark the court to just jump on board and give the government everything at once in court. I mean, it's, it's just almost amazing. All these decisions going in favor of the court, of the government over and over. But there are other kinds of wars that actually look like the court is now punishing the government. And it took me a long time to figure this out. Those other kinds of wars, Korea, the Vietnam War, the Gulf War, these were wars where the court didn't like them. And even though in other contexts the court issued pro-government decisions in court, uh, in, in tax, the court did not. And so what I found is that the only legitimate cue of a serious policy, foreign policy crisis is a spike in defense spending. Declarations of war just aren't enough. Deployments of troops aren't enough. Um, so in some ways I feel like this is the same here. Like when we see like a serious economic crisis, 
then we'll start acting in a way that supports the government, but otherwise we think you're manufacturing problems. We think that the problems, in fact, are due to you. So in some ways, this kind of dichotomous theoretical perspective I have grows out of the war um, book, but I still agree. I agree, we only have a small amount of data, it's only two variables I can test it, and, and you're not even convinced, which makes it even a bigger problem. Jane? <laughs> well, I, and just to listen to you now and responding a little bit to Tony, I mean, it's not that you don't have a theory, but you haven't articulated it in the kind of classic deductive way, and that maybe it would help to think about, you know, what are the axiomatic positions that you take with rationality, right? And then sort of go down from it in the sense where you would, you know, engage some theoretical propositions or some starting assumptions, and that that may help to see, you know, how it is across those two time cycles that you would see differences. Another area, which I don't know, maybe you've not looked in this area, but the American political development literature and political science might help you to think about, you know, how it is that things are sort of doing this, right? And like, like Steve Skoranek's work, where I'm thinking in particular of Dan Tishner's work on immigration policy and how it is that the court and Congress and the president all sort of interact with one another in this time at which the sometimes there's push and pull. One of his main variables is the presence of external factors, in particular of conflict and war, that could be useful in that. Because what you've got now is this like really stretched out thing that, you know, you have a long time cycle and you have, you know, different sort of political pushes and pulls. And it's hard to theorize that because on the one hand you want to be make you're making a higher level argument and yet you're then you get caught up in how to divide up the times and what's important then so maybe that's a literature that could be useful with respect to you know like uh, what's that guy Paul Pearson you know uh, path dependencies and politics and time and you know in, in that tradition that might help you to think about the uh, dependency of one set of decisions from a, a previous one on the basis of like the depression yeah. which has forever altered the way that judges think about the significance of, or everybody thinks about the significance of recession, long-standing recession or economic decline. Yeah. I mean, I, I, there's still, I mean, this is just so preliminary, it's almost ridiculous. Um, and, you know, I could have put up these other slides. I probably should have put up these other slides that give a little bit more background on the theoretical perspective, but it's not actually more nuanced than what I just articulated. But you guys, I realize, cared about that. <laughs> so it was a mistake in terms of my presenting to the audience. But, um, you know, I, it's there, but I don't think it's still necessarily convincing. For the primary reason, June, that you articulated is, at what point do we say we're now there in this extreme, I mean, we could say 1929, but so what? We've had stock market crashes and many other um, time periods, 86 is one. Mm -hmm. So I completely agree with you. And so in some ways, I actually feel, um, notwithstanding Tony's critique, that the harder thing here is the empirics rather than the theory, in part because there's just so much theory out there that already, that I'm just, just literally building on that's so widely accepted. But I feel like there's all sorts of selection problems with this database. Um, so, you know, whether I'm even, whether these findings will be robust to the Heckman selection model and all the other um, plans I have, whether I can really come up with an answer to what you were articulating, which is, you know, when do we even know when we're in one cycle and in a different one is, is another one, so maybe I have to throw out the pre-1950s era, I don't know. And then, you know, if you're not even buying the theory, especially with the pre-1950s, and that needs a lot of work as well. But, um, so let me just yeah. respond to Christian. Yeah. Because Christian, you were saying, ah, there are differences, and I think that's another biggie, yeah. like. One up, one up, uh, you go first, yeah. Because um, voters are just busy and don't care about politics, and it's not like they're judges who are there to evaluate the merits of the case. Yeah. Voters just say, I'm busy, the economy's bad, I don't want to lose my job, I'm voting against the Republicans. Right, in 2008. Well, judges are at the case, so that's another difference, too. They have they're more expertise, and it's so main, but maybe not, maybe they're just using cues. Yeah. So. Right, well, so that's what I was kind of um, signaling, is I, these different, different arguments on why the, the populace, the voters, are punishing the government. It doesn't seem like there's widespread agreement on that, though you and Jane know this, that answer better than me. It seems like some people will argue X, some people argue Y. Is there an agreement on, yeah, that's kind of how I thought about it. So I, I was thinking um, not all voters are worried about losing their job, and yet they're still, I mean, all of us, you know, with tenure, I guess. <laughs> I should, um, you know, don't have that worry, and we still are acting as some of these models say. So I'm not sure it's about losing your job, though I know that argument's out there. But still, you know, another way to think about this, to draw the differences, 
you know, here are these group of um, nine actors who were appointed by the elite. They speak to the elite at parties. Why would they act like a common person and not their friends on the Hill? So I do think that there is a problem in making that assumption. But upon thinking about it, I actually think it's legit in part because, look, the justices want a thriving economy. They have financial portfolios. You know, they have kids with jobs. I mean, I'm just not sure why they would not care at all. So I think they, and also, they already have their job. They don't need to pander to the elite anymore. They can't lose their job. So they might be at cocktail parties, but still think that these current actors are not acting competently. And the other thing that I think about is, um, I think justice are even in a better position to punish the government actors. And the reason I think they're in a better position is because they have a whole, well, they're in a worse position because they can't boot the, the government actors out. The incumbents, there's no ability to, need to vote these people out of office. But the justices get to take a multi-pronged approach. You're doing pretty good with financial, the, the markets right now, but you're doing terrible with crime. So they can take a very nuanced approach to the docket and decide pro-government here because crime is way down, but anti-government here because the economy is, um, you know, so on and so forth. So in some ways, I actually think they have the same preferences as voters, only they're better at it. They can, they can, you know, examine each and every type of substantive question and then respond appropriately, shutting down certain programs and policies, bolstering others. So in that sense, I actually think it's even more crazy for them not to act. Like, they should be doing this, even more so than voters, who we could just get another incompetent in. All right, Nancy. Thanks very Thank much. Thank you, you guys. Thank you.